Welcome to Agile World Better English. Agile World was created by Sabrina Bruce and Carl Smith to focus on agility within a global community. We are Better English, and we're only one of the shows in the Agile World family. We have an Agile World French, we have Agile World Spanish, we have Agile World Indie, and we have Agile World UK English. Did I miss one? Did another one pop up? Steve over the weekend. Pro pro probably, but you know. <laughs> probably there's at least five. <laughs> so no matter who you are or what you do, you can listen and learn about agility. I'm Cynthia Khan, founder of GSD Mindset and Agile Consultancy, and my co-host is Steve Mowbray. He and I are both passionate about Agile. Through this podcast, we plan to share experiences about how others apply Agile principles in their lives and in their businesses to become successful so you too can apply them and be successful too. Steve, I'm so excited about our guest today. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about Linda? Hey, thank, thanks, Cynthia. Uh, sure. And welcome to Agile World, everyone. I, I'm Steve Mowbray, and I'm an enterprise Agile coach. And I, um, you know, I, my Agile journey has been going on for, for about 20 years now, and I, I'm just thrilled that we have an amazing guest today. Um, Linda Rising is with us, and I love Linda so much because one is, well, she's extremely nice and extremely personable, but um, she started off, she did one of the, the most major um, studies on Scrum, very technical type study with very detailed um, you know, metrics and measurements and stuff, but she also has expanded the idea of agility and change into the people issues, into truly understanding what makes us tick. And today we have a lovely, lovely topic. And oh, and, and, and Linda is also uh, recently received from the Agility Forum, the Lifetime Achievement Award, because she is that awesome. So I'm gonna give her a little round of applause. And because she's that awesome. But today we're gonna talk about a fun, fun topic it is Linda Rising talking about we're rational and those people aren't. So why can't we change together? <laughs> Linda, how are you today? I am awesome. And it's so wonderful to be here with the two of you. So thank you for inviting me. And also thank you for all you do to make the world a better place. We need lots of help these days to move forward. Yes, we do. And we were so great, gr so grateful to have you. And, um, you know, you have helped so many people because because we were taught we were talking about six months ago and uh, just going through all of the people you've helped in the very in the various backgrounds that you've that you've done and you've you've partnered with so many people. It's just it's thousands, isn't it? Tens of thousands, maybe, maybe more. I'm just shocked. Well, I think some of it has to do with the fact that I'm incredibly old. Oh, next no. year, <laughs> next year will be a milestone birthday for me. I will be eighty. Wow! Oh, wow. Congratulations! Wow! You have so much energy. How do you? Because you have more energy than I do. And <laughs> I mean, I, I'm older than dirt, but I get away with it because because I act very childish. So so people think I'm much younger. But um, how the heck do you have so much energy? <laughs> I think it's just a few simple things that your mother told you. She said, get enough sleep, get some exercise, watch your diet, don't stress out over things that are not important, and surround yourself with people who love you. That's really beautiful. That last those, those are good words. <laughs> yes. I, I'm going to mention that, that we're, we're starting Agile World Wellness, so, right. so I might come back to you <laughs> <laughs> for another topic here in the next month or so. <laughs> Actually, the answer is I have no idea. I think that probably a lot of things are just random. I was just lucky. I just happened to be in that place at that time. And I was fortunate enough to have people who helped me along. I'm not sure any of it was intentional. So a lot of us got where we are because we had help from awesome people. And I'm certainly one of those. You are one of those awesome people and you have helped, <laughs> helped thousands. So 
<laughs> so I love that about you. And I have a feeling it doesn't really matter what place you were in. I mean, we're grateful that you were in the place that, that, that you were. But I think wherever you, you, you were, you were going to achieve something wonderful and help people. You're, you're a healer at heart. And, and you, you help people and heal them. I think that's just what you do. You're good at it. Natural for you. I agree. Sure. You, I, I, I agree. A little bit of a little bit of fate, because if there wasn't any fate or just a little bit of uncertainty, it wouldn't be so much fun when we got to where we wanted to be, right? So yeah. if, we, if, we, if everything was perfectly planned, like we, traditional thinking, then we wouldn't need to have an agile mindset, then would we? So everything that's happened now has sparked us into agility, I think. That is right. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Yeah. Well, well, the the the, gr the growth mindset, especially how how Carol Dweck, you know, kind of kind of proposed the, the whole concept of mindset, is so perfect for anything really, not just agility, but across the board. We should all have growth mindsets because everything's changing so quickly. So, what are your thoughts on that, Linda? I I agree, and I think well, especially now. I don't know if you pay attention to the social science research, but they're going through a lot of problems in replicating some of the older, the classic experiments. And that is work, including work by Carol Dweck. And what I'm happy to see is that her results do replicate. So it's not as though there are any changes or upheavals in what she found in all of those experiments that she did with children, adults, people in business, people in sports, those results still hold. For those who don't know, because not everyone's an Agilist or some of them are new Agilists, could you give us a little key into what some of the longstanding hypotheses that still exist today that she looked sure. at? and. Yeah, this is the work of Carol Dweck. She's still at Stanford. She's a social science researcher. And when she began doing these experiments, she was as surprised as everyone else who read about the results. She didn't expect it. So the experimental version I typically talk about has to do with children, that children were assigned randomly to two different groups. And the only difference between the two groups was one group was given a very hard test. The test was given back and they were told, you did very well. You must have worked hard. The other group also given a hard test, gave the test back and they said, you did very well. You must be really smart. And just for that small difference, they saw a series of results that led them to believe that encouraging people to believe that working hard leads to different results from being told how smart you are, how good you are, how talented you are, how pretty you are, how handsome you are. For me, it applied directly to Agile because in the Agile mindset, that's what we are all about. We are not about believing that we are perfect. We are about believing that we are learning and that we are working hard to try things, to experiment, possibly to fail. There's a direct mapping, I think, between the growth mindset and the Agile mindset. So our belief in learning, moving forward, trying things, getting better. So I'm really happy that Carol's work has been validated and that now more schools are using it, more businesses are using it. There was even an article in Harvard Business Review talking about the growth mindset for business. Oh, yeah, it's not even news anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and it's, it's, it's the whole concept. And one of the things, there's a couple of things I've, I've, been, I've been doing for the last year, year or so because I, I ran into a situation where I realized mindset was, was the biggest thing. I, I, I feel it's the biggest thing 
<clears throat> that, that's happening is one is I would just start adding yet to the end of sentences when, when people are speaking. Oh, we can't do that. I mean, you mean you can't do that yet? Or, or you know, we, we, we haven't learned how to do that yet. And, and um, you know, or, or just because that that's what we decided three months ago, does, does that mean it's still the right decision? Um, and I've also worked, started working with my son and daughter. Uh, my son has always worked really hard in school, um, but he, he's also, he has a pretty natural talent for soccer. You know, he's, he's pretty good. And we used to tell him he was talented. And then I switched that conversation to Max, you know, you know, you've got talent, but if you work hard, you can be really good. And I've seen the change in him. Um, he's now on a select team. He's now, uh, and I, I watch him, he helps the coaches. He helps, uh, he, he's become a much better team player. He, he always had it naturally, but he's really expanded and starts to work hard and thinks more uh, thoughtfully about it. My daughter now um, doesn't see that working hard or studying hard is, is the wrong thing to do. She doesn't see it that, that she has to do it because she's not smart. I mean, she is. She's, she's a very brilliant girl. But she, she now sees it as, oh, this is part of the learning. This is something that we all have to do. Um, yeah. So daddy's working hard to learn because daddy keeps learning. So maybe we should do. <laughs> That's an interesting social study, given how they talk about Gen, Gen X, Gen Z, and all, and the millennials, and how we used to give everybody a trophy, and now, now we're saying, well, maybe we shouldn't. And so it's very interesting. You can actually, being old is a good thing, because we can see the results of different approaches to child enlightenment and child education, basically, right? And I know we're not even talking about the topic that we had started with, so we'll probably have to go back. But when you started mentioning all of this, I started thinking about how I was raised and how I saw the people who were a few years younger and then my son's in his 20s and like how I raised him. And we fought against the everybody getting a, you know, a, a, a trophy because he was in that generation. And, and now we're kind of making little tweaks, but I, I find that that's also a very agile mindset, right? Because we, we see what different approaches do and, and affect our, our adult children. Yeah. That's a very, we fasc it's fascinating. I'm sorry. Yeah, we don't, we don't want to um, denigrate all of those people who no. said, <laughs> oh, you're so smart. It was part of, in the 70s, oh, this yeah. research around self-esteem because there was evidence that people who were successful had high self-esteem and when they saw those results they got very excited and said ah oh, well this is how we will prepare our children for success we will make sure that they have high self-esteem and so everyone well-intentioned smart people, parents, teachers, researchers all began to say, we should tell our children, oh, you're so smart. Oh, you can do anything. Oh, you're perfect. Oh, you're so talented. And not realizing that correlation is not causation. Yes. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Successful people do have high self-esteem. That's how it works. It's not that high self-esteem necessarily leads to success. They are correlated, but one doesn't cause the other. We had it backwards. You know? <laughs> <laughs> success causes it. Be, yeah. be, having a little self-esteem, working and succeeding grows yeah. the, and gains more self-esteem. Not, I, But I know yes. that there's a lot of people who grow up where their parents don't encourage them in certain things that they love. So, I mean, we have to definitely do a balance, but you can, it's very interesting to see. And that's why I think they call them different generations, not only because of that, but because a parenting approach is also expanded oh, yeah. over that time. Yeah, and, and as Carol Dweck says, it's the fixed mindset is not a characteristic necessarily of smart kids or talented kids whose parents told them, oh, you're so smart. Oh, you can do anything. Oh, you're so talented in playing the violin or soccer or whatever it is. It's also those children who were told, and it's horrible to imagine that you don't have it. Oh, I know. Mm -hmm. That's you, are, you are so <laughs> stupid. You will never achieve anything. That's the other side of the spectrum of the fixed mindset 
is children can be put into a box, whether they're talented or whether they were always told by their parents that they wouldn't achieve anything, that they didn't have any talent. They are both sides of the same coin. And that was, that became her focus was to talk to those children who were always told, oh, you don't have it. Oh, you're not smart. And to move them into the growth mindset or to the agile mindset. And that also applies to organizations because some organizations are so stuck in that old fixed mindset where everybody's in a box and people believe, oh, I can't do it. I'm not the database guru. So I will never be able to learn how to solve all those database problems. Oh, that's no, that's that guy over there. He's the one that's really smart. And so you see that on both sides of the coin, the people who are told, oh, you're so smart. And the people who are told, oh, you'll never amount to anything. I've, I've personally had conversations, especially with agility, when people realize that, and this, I'm going to try to segue into your, our real top, the topic we were going to talk about. <laughs> but I actually had someone who was a director call me at a company and say to me, because he didn't want to be agile when he realized what it was. And he goes, well, you're really going to have to prove your worth. <laughs> I'm like, well, I've all, and you're thinking in your head, I've been here for a month. This is not good. <laughs> I don't think what he's basically saying is like, I wish I never hired you. And organizations who say that to people who are different, just from the thought, right, is just crazy and so steve why don't we why don't you lead us into the main event today go, go, go ahead cynthia no, no it's okay. <laughs> basically when we were writing back well not me but steve and linda were writing back and forth the one thing that linda decided was that it would, would be really interesting to talk about how when we go into organizations even as agilists it's like us and they think differently. We're the rational people. We've even fallen into it in the conversation we've had so far by saying people are have a stuck mindset and things like that. We've already labeled people. So Linda, tell us a little about your work and how you can get even me, and I'm probably Steve's been guilty of it too, to think and approach differently because I think all of us need a little help. Well, for, first of all, it's a cognitive bias that we have. And if you've read Thinking Fast and Slow and you've looked at the work of Daniel Kahneman who proved through experiment, through using science that there are a whole host of these cognitive biases that we have. And every now and then I ask myself, why is it we keep arguing with other people, people who don't agree with us, usually on some contentious subject, like why aren't you vaccinated? Or why do you live your life this way? Why do you hold certain beliefs that are different from mine? And usually the approach is logical argument. Let me explain this to you. Don't you look at the data. Can't you see? I live in Tennessee, which is one of the worst states. Look at the data here for Tennessee. Can't you see the ICUs are overflowing? I have a friend who had a stroke who had to wait in the emergency room for 16 hours because every bed was full. Don't you understand? And we don't really make any headway. We're not convincing the people we're talking to who hear us spout those statistics, run through that logic, are never influenced, never change their minds. And so we walk away thinking, well, what's wrong with them? <laughs> are they those stupid? people would just listen to us if yeah, they, they must do be, what we tell them? <laughs> they, they must be stupid. Or they're not listening. They're not really listening. They didn't hear what I had to say. There must be something wrong with their brains. They didn't get a trophy. They didn't get a trophy. Yeah, <laughs> must be. Must. It's clearly. It's so clearly something wrong with them. So I wonder why do we keep doing that? 
when we don't have any success with it. And I finally had to realize that we use that approach as the first thing in our back pocket when we're having a conversation with somebody who disagrees with us, we immediately rush to that logical argument based on facts. Here are the headlines from the New York Times I just read this morning. Let me cite these numbers for Tennessee. That's exactly what we all do. It's an instinct for us to approach other people that way because we think that's how we make our decisions. When in reality, we are blowing all, my mind right now. <laughs> we all make our decisions for other reasons. We are not, as a species, designed to make progress logically. Our brains evolved to keep us alive. And so there's a huge module that just devoted to storytelling. And it tells us a story about the world. Here's how the world operates. And we think we are interpreting reality and that we see it clearly and we make decisions based on logic. We all believe that every single one of us. When in reality, we're just listening to that storyteller and that storyteller not only doesn't see reality, it doesn't even care. <laughs> That's not its job. Its no. job is to make us happy with where we are and what we're doing and to make us feel that we're okay. We're the good guys. And those other people who don't agree with us, well, they are the bad guys. So we divide the world up. We see the world is agile. The world is vaccinated. Wouldn't it be wonderful if those people could see this? <laughs> yeah. Yes. If people were just like us and understood. Yes. Right? Yes. <laughs> And here we are, all agile is saying diversity is good. Uh, when really, I think when we hire people, someone comes in for an interview and we start using this phrase, well, I'm not sure this person would fit with our culture. Oh my goodness, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is and probably is, maybe exactly what you need to shake it up a little bit. You need a little, you need some diversity. Diversity is not just the way you look, right? Diversity is also in the way that you think. The way so, you think, yep. Yeah. So Linda, how can we, how can we even fix ourselves as agilists? Because I think we become evangelists in some aspects a lot of the time. And yes, it, yes people so don't understand what about, we're saying or where we're coming from. Religion. Yeah. about religion that's about belief and so logic has nothing to do with it we have a, another bias called confirmation bias that says mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what's out there we will filter that so that it <laughs> lines up with what we believe and then we can convince ourselves that yes i did look at the evidence it shows very clearly that i am right <laughs> And yep. we do that, we do that so easily that we're not even aware that we're doing it. So the solution, if there is a solution, is to do what I did after the election in 2016, when I was ready to pack up and leave my country. I just thought, I cannot stay here. This is horrible. And then I realized that, no, 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 no. I, this is growth mindset. I have to stay here and I have to work. I have to work hard. I have to do what I can. I don't know exactly what I'm going to do. And I don't know what is the problem and how could I address that? So I was lucky. Again, we talked about this earlier. I was lucky to find an organization called Braver Angels. 
Now, there are many others that do the same thing. This is a political organization, but it doesn't take sides. Its mission is to bring together equal numbers of people who are on one side and people who are on the other side, reds and blues, what we say in the US, bring them together and have very structured conversations. So when I joined and I went to the first workshop, I thought, well, wait, I know about facilitation. I know about talking to people who don't agree with me. I know about agile transformations where you've got this organization that's been doing things a certain way and now you're gonna introduce some change. I know all about that. I wrote the book. <laughs> I was wrong. I <laughs> was so wrong. <laughs> I'd never really had a conversation of any kind about a serious topic that was more than just, oh, well, you think waterfall is good and I think agile is good. Okay, that can be difficult. But when you talk to somebody about abortion rights, gun control, whether or not you think Donald Trump is the best president ever, Sorry. <laughs> Those are difficult topics. And to have that conversation with someone and not immediately, I mean, from the get go, not immediately begin to think this person is an idiot. <laughs> that was so hard. But if you can do that, it's not that you're going to change that other person's mind. It's that you're going to change yourself. And the biggest area where the change is going to happen is your belief that that is a worthwhile person you're talking to. And that changes everything. So that's what's missing is that we don't have those conversations. We exclude those people, whether we do it consciously or unconsciously. We avoid them. We don't want to have those difficult conversations because the only thing we know how to do is logically put the facts in front of them and say, what's wrong with you in some form or fashion? And what we don't want to do is really listen to what that other person has to say and be open to possibly admitting that maybe their point of view is as valid, is as worthwhile, is as intelligent as mine. Even if our conclusions are so different, because we have to work together. If we can only work with people who think the same way we do, then we're gonna wind up with the polarized situation that we have right now, not just in the US, but in the world. If we can't work together with somebody who has radically different views, then we're not gonna make progress as a species. We can't agree on climate change. We can't agree on the big issues. It's hard. I'm not saying it's not hard. So I've been doing that since 2016 and it's still, <laughs> it's still a struggle. I'll tell you what, and this latest workshop, and of course it's all on Zoom now, I was paired up with a, a, a lady who's a red, I'm a blue, obviously. And at the end of our conversation, she said, I don't know that I can make it through. This is really hard. Oh. She said, you know, you're really a nice person. <laughs> and just, just the way she said it, she wasn't expecting that. She was expecting to come to this workshop and show all those blue people how wrong they were. And instead, our experience led her to believe that I was okay. 
And of course, a lot of blues came into the workshop with the same attitude and walked out feeling, you know, th those people are okay. They're really nice people. They're smart people. They're well-intentioned people. They care. It's just that our conclusions, our different points of view has led us down different paths. And now we can't reach out. We can't have a conversation. So if Agile is gonna make a difference, if anyone is gonna make a difference, it will only be because we can have those very difficult conversations. It's a struggle, it's a challenge. Do you guys have kind of like in the whole concept of retrospective, so now you come together, what's working, what's not working. Was there ever an ending of well, you know what, if we could just try this one thing, maybe we could move the needle to get closer because I think eventually we have to see each other as people and then we also have to be able to at least try one little thing that'll work, right? Maybe we're not gonna come up as they're having problems right now in the United States with three point whatever trillion dollars, but maybe we can make an agreement on a much smaller scale that'll move the needle, the kind of Pareto 80, 20, is there anything that we can do to move the needle with people who don't agree with us so that we can at least move the needle? Because keeping in an argumentative state and not moving at all, it's still a decision and isn't getting us to where we need to be. So what are your thoughts on that, Linda? <laughs> well, you know that we are what's called complex adaptive systems as individuals, <laughs> as organizations, as countries, that's what we are. And there is a science behind complex adaptive systems. And it says the way to change is by doing small things. It's called probing. You kind of poke it. You do some little thing and then you stop and you look back and you say, well, what happened there? How was that? And then you decide what your next little step is gonna be. It is all about little tiny things. It's about my being able to talk to my neighbor, the guy who lives around the corner, who has been flying his American flag at half staff since Donald Trump lost the election in 2020. But I go by his house every day and if he's out in front, I say, hey, how are you doing today? Everything okay with you? Did you get over to play racquetball? He's a big racquetball fan. So if I can do that and we can talk about racquetball or how are you as a person? How are you doing? Because in the past, I wouldn't have done that. In the past, I would have walked the other way. So I didn't have to go by his house and I didn't have to talk to him. So those little tiny things are what we can all do. And I'm a believer in small change. It's called baby steps. It's a pattern. And in fact, that's the only way is for little I, tiny steps. I love, I love that concept. Do that. We can all do that. Yes. And we all should, because as, as consultants, one of the things that we try to do is we immediately try to go to a process. Yeah. But here's, here's the process. Here's the guide yeah. that tells us what to do. Here's what, and, and yeah. as consultants, maybe organizations want us to do that. But as coaches, mentors, and leaders, we may need to do something else. And the first thing, you know, from, from what, what you've been saying is we need to first accept the people as whole. You're okay. You disagree with me. You don't believe what I believe, but that doesn't mean you're defective. You're okay. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. And, it, and oh. it, should, it should never be with the idea that I'm going to convince all of you that you're wrong. At some point, we're all going to be marching to the same drum. No, we probably never will all be the same. And that should never be the goal. Because we know diversity makes for more creative, more innovative teams. We know that diversity helps us expand our point of view. We know that diversity is good for all of us. 
if we ever get to the point where we can just say, oh, yes, we're all thinking the same way. We don't have any really serious discussions anymore because we all think the same. Then we're in real trouble. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So I think the goal is really not to change the process or to change people's mind. The goal is to just get is to just yeah. practice understanding each other. And I think that's what Agile really is all about. Like agility. Agile, agility cannot be, or resilience. Maybe if we had a bunch of words that we thought meant what Agile means. Agile means learning. Agile means moving forward together. Agile doesn't mean we all do the same thing in the same way and we all think the same thing. I don't think that was ever the intention. Whether it was expressed explicitly or not, it has to be about embracing. Isn't that a word we say? Embracing diversity, embracing change, mm -hmm. embracing failure. And somehow we lost some of that early fervor for agility. And we kind of got locked into, oh, well, you're not agile because you're not doing <laughs> these 10 things. And it's got to be done this way because I know I'm the intelligent person you brought in here and you people are stupid. Somehow we lost that. Well, did did we lose did we lose it or or did we did we ever have it? It seems well, like it's something that we're still trying to to gather and wrap, and wrap our heads around. It and because it, it is so it is so challenging. And you know the very yeah. one of the very first things conversation over contracts, right? Yeah. Conversations. Yeah, and it's and the the battle we fight is that there are so many organizations and so many high level people in organizations who want an answer. They don't want you to tell them that we have a better way and it involves resilience and agility and learning and they don't want to hear that. They want a list so they can go check, check, check. Mm -hmm. We've got that. Yeah, okay, so now we know what to do moving forward. They want a plan, regardless of what they say. They want to know what's going to happen. They want control. That's why this pandemic is so, so difficult for so many people, because we don't know what's going to happen next week or next month, let alone next year. Organizations survive because they have some ability to forecast. Mm -hmm. They want to plan. They don't like it when you tell them or even just hint that, well, we don't know. This is about learning. We're doing baby steps and we want what's best, what people are going to adapt. This team over here might decide to do daily standups. This team over here might not. No, no. Even the most innovative, creative, little not ginormous organizations, but little tiny organizations. I was just talking with one last week. They still want answers. Yeah. They don't like it when you tell them, well, you know, you could do this or this is possible. No, no. They want to know what is it and when is it going to happen? And I want to put that on the wall and I want a checklist and I want a chart that shows me what's going to happen over the next five weeks or whatever. So there's that organizational pressure that has moved us from the very beginning. Linda, is, is it possible that it's the system that we're working in as yeah. opposed to just the individual? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a complex adaptive system. We are all part of that. In fact, individually, we were talking about wellness earlier. We are complex adaptive systems. We are hard to change. It's hard to get us going in any given direction, whether it's to exercise or eat right or make sure we get enough sleep or stop using our screens. And now you put a lot of us together in some community, organization, country. Yeah, now there are problems that are there because we are in this complex adaptive system. 
But if those people will just listen to what I say, we're great, <laughs> right? <laughs> What's wrong with them? What's wrong with those people? I mean, they want a plan. What? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't think planning is the problem. It seems to me that it's more the inability to understand whether they're going in, to actually look at things in in and stand back and go, you know, I'm going in the I'm going the world is pivoting and I'm still going straight. What I need to pivot a little bit in their business and that's why I think businesses go out of business sometimes because they don't rec- they're so busy worrying about their plans and the measurements that they're measuring and this and that and they're getting their bonuses based on something that they decided 9 months ago when 3 or 4 months ago the world shifted and they yeah. were they're still tracking the old way so i think i think it's good to have a plan because we should all have sailing into some direction or else we would be adrift without a purpose but I think we need to also constantly that I'm very into the reflection part of agility to making sure that you're looking at where you are and getting feedback on what you think you're going because you may need to, to change a little bit. And so I think with all of the things that we're doing, I think with organizations seeing the people who work for them as people and maybe government stop, stop seeing people as revenue generators, you know, like taxpayers yeah. versus individuals in my, who have needs and wants, we've, we've lost a lot of that at, in a lot of aspects, right? That our leadership in all sorts of areas has, they, they categorize this as some word that isn't human. Sure. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I hate the term resources. And, oh yeah. Anyway, right. Linda, <laughs> Lin, Linda, let me ask you one, one, one final, one final question is, <laughs> so, so based on what we've just talked about, what can, what, what, what can we do? What can I do tomorrow or this afternoon or later, later today to start changing my mindset or to, to start putting some, some guardrails around my mindset to know when I'm, when I'm easing into, when I'm moving too far over to that fixed mindset or getting away from it and starting to do that, that, oh, that, that us versus them concept, those people listen to what I say. If you could just do what I tell you, if you just knew what I knew, then you would, you know, how can we do, what can we do there? Talk less, listen more. (laughs) That's pretty dang simple, isn't it? (laughs) That is pretty simple. And that's hard to do because if you're a consultant and you're talking to people in an organization, you think, well, they're paying me by the word. The more (laughs) I talk, the better it is. If they ask me a question, I better have an answer. If they present me with a problem, I better have a solution. And we spend almost no time, because every now and then I'll monitor that, and I'm not very good at it myself, is we don't really listen. We are getting ready. Got that index file card in our brain, and they said, oh, they said this. So, okay, I got my card ready. And I can cite those statistics or share my experience or whatever. So we're talkers. And that's what we do for a living. And rarely do we ever just sit down and it's better one-on-one, even on a Zoom meeting. And we just say, well, all right, what do you think about this? Because every now and then you don't have to say a word. Sometimes that other person will actually move around and if you let them go long enough, they'll wind up exactly where you want them to go and you haven't said a thing. That's a pattern in fearless change it's called fearless. You listen them into agreeing with you. That also works if you're married, by the way. <laughs> don't oh, try to talk married. them into it don't try to talk them and just say oh i see okay you you don't have time to do this errand i understand mm-hmm. and then you wait mm-hmm. yeah and pretty soon you'll say okay i guess i could do it <laughs> <laughs> you listen them you listen them 
Hmm. I didn't know you were going to help with marriage counseling today. That's awesome. <laughs> We've run the gamut. <laughs> Is there anything you can't do, Linda? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. I don't. My husband and I are serious bike riders, and every year we do a bike trip, and every year I think, I don't know whether I can make it all the way across Missouri this year. Maybe we'll just take a little slice of that. So I can see myself. I don't have the stamina that I did. I'm slowing down. But you rode all the way across across Missouri? You, you, yeah. You because we rode motorcycles from did D.C. You? to Missouri, and it <laughs> took us... We, we, we took a long trip. It, we had 11 days. Wow. And we, we did over, over 3,000 miles. And um, it, was, it was so funny. We ran into, you know, you, you, you stop because the, there's three guys running on motorcycles and, and we ran into somebody at a, at a you know, rest, rest stop. And, and we were telling him our, our story. And he's like, oh, three grown men with no adult supervision? That's amazing. <laughs> Okay. Well, my daughter is a motorcycle rider. She and her husband both ride motorcycles. And not only that, but they have a rock band, Phoenix wow. Rising. So their website is prising.com and they play at a lot of biker bars. Oh, and very just, cool. Just to show you how uh, we all stereotype before I really got to know all of those people. I sort of stereotyped people who ride motorcycles. I thought, mm, you know, those people, but they <laughs> are the nicest, friendliest, kindest. They are what I call cause people. You get them excited about, uh, I'm a supporter of Habitat for Humanity. You get them excited about building a home and they will be there. They will donate money. They will work hard. They are awesome. So I love those motorcycle riders and Al. They are just unbelievable. And I saw it in myself. Change from one belief about those people <laughs> to 180 degrees. They are awesome. That is wonderful. That is so wonderful to hear. And all of this information is going to be in the in the show notes at, at the so when people go to the website, um, Linda, we've kept you for about 40 minutes. And this is just fabulous. I could listen to you all day. But, um, but maybe maybe we should we should uh, close this session out. And, and I will talk to you about agile wellness. Okay, that sounds good. Now, Cynthia, <laughs> what's what you got for us? <laughs> in case, Linda, that you did not know, Agile World is on all social media sites. You're going to get a lot of exposure. We're on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Tumblr. The podcasts are on so many different channels. Spotify, I'm going to have to read them. Spotify, Apple, Google, Pocket Cast, Anchor, Breaker, Public Radio, Stitcher, and CastBox. The video version is going to be on our Agile World YouTube channel and available from our website, agile-world.news. If you or any of your friends want to contact us with ideas for the Agile World Better English podcast, then they can email me at Cynthia at agile-world.news or Steve at Steve at agile-world.news. So... We're going to catch you on the flip side, baby. You're going to be everywhere. <laughs> awesome. You guys are awesome. Thank you, Linda. Thank you so much. You know what? I love who you are and I love what you do. You, it's Thank just, you it's just su such a pleasure to see you again. So please, everyone, we are going to have all of this information in our show notes. I can't wait to hear about prising.com. I want to, want to hear this music and to learn so much more. Anyway, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Bye. Bye.